So, John, I'm going to start off with two questions, really. Uh, the first one is, how did nature get you onto the spiritual path? I was very fortunate. My mother bore me on a spring morning uh, with cherry blossom outside the window in a lovely country setting. Um, nowhere near hospitals or any of that. So I grew up with it. I grew up with grass and sunshine and well, the cherry blossom passed, but then came the cherries and uh, just the familiar trees and bushes and grass that surrounded me. This was my, this was my life. I knew nothing else. It was, I was born before the war, and then the war broke out when I was uh, two years old. And uh, virtually all social life, not that I ever had any social life, sort of ended then. We were very isolated. I hardly knew what another little boy was throughout my childhood. Never heard of football or hardly knew what a motor car was. Um, there was a farm <clears throat> nearby that I used to love to go to. Of course, they still had horses then, and uh, farm horses, work horses, and uh, of course, I adored these, and uh, sheep and cows. So these were my natural brothers and sisters, really. I did have an older sister, but uh, she t tended to play more with a couple of girls that lived a few fields away. Um, so I was very, very much alone and uh, never felt I was alone. Didn't know what loneliness was as a child because I had surrounded by all my little friends of nature, my rabbit and my lizard and our dog, of course. I was used to being quiet. I never was much of a talker. So that's how nature got in first, long before I'd ever heard of a spirit or had any interest in spirit. <laughs> I'm, I'm just soaked in nature. <laughs> Lovely. And then I believe you went off to Peru uh, with a kind of altruistic motivation <clears throat> of like saving the planet by... <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your... what happened when you went to Peru and... I was one of those lucky children that, that always knew what I wanted to do. In fact, I used to say to my mother, so she says, that I came into this world to be a farmer. I don't know how I knew that, but that's what I said apparently as I was a little boy. And I've always been a, a farmer. I loved farming. And um, of course, this was long before the days of chemicals and machinery before that, when the industrial farms, as we know it today, when farming was farming. <laughs> it was more way of life than the business then. Um, and uh, and when, as, when I grew up uh, in my early 20s, uh, I began to sort of think a bit more broadly. And, um, and at that time, uh, we were beginning to hear something about what was then called the third world. And I remember there was some adver advertisements appeared then of little starving children, which really opened a window to many people like myself who never really thought much about in any in other countries. And I think really I was more interested in, 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 in soil erosion then and they were um, they were offering um, grants of a of a thousand hectares of bolivian jungle to anybody who'd go and develop it and i thought i'd go off and do this i'd take my axe with me and and fell the jungle of course it wasn't a bad thing to do it seemed a good thing to do and grow food for hungry people you see <laughs> but that didn't quite work out but i ended up in peru and um and got into, I was going to reforest the Andes, which were badly eroded, and I knew a bit about soil erosion. And, um, and so I started a little project to reforest the Andes, and uh, I didn't get on too badly there, but also did not too well. Uh, and there was one notable occasion sitting on a, on a mountain top, uh, sort of pondering my success failure <laughs> and the little boy seemed to say to me to make whole be whole to make whole be whole 
which of course I didn't understand at the time. But I had uh, not long previously uh, read a book about meditation, not that I knew what it was. But anyway, when my time in Peru ended and I came home, I looked for and found a school of meditation. Well, I mean, you told me that it was the school of meditation in Holland yeah. Park and that it was basically mantra-based. Have I understood that correctly? Correct, yes, yes, yes. And you were terribly diligent. And Did it immediately click, or what, did it take a while to click for you? No, I took to it like a duck to water. It was ever so, so uh, natural. <laughs> and um, we were told, I, it was... The school was, was, was quite sternly organised and we were told this was really required of us to do, uh, it was just quarter of an hour, night and morning regularly, which I, which I did and I've, I've uh, I practised twice a day ever since, really all my life. And of course I do longer now, but uh, that's how I started. And the very first practice I uh, I, I did was in St Pancras Station waiting room because I had to get the late night train back again because I had already started farming to feed my animals. And I sat in that, uh, that uh, dingy, unconducive place, you'd think, late at night and did my first practice. And it all opened up like that. And I suddenly realised I didn't have to go all the way to South America to find mountains and the wide open spaces. It was all within me. And, Wonderful. <laughs> and, and very, very soon after that, um, because of course this space is invisible, it's, it, it doesn't, it's silent. I realized that this actually is what the Bible calls spirit and what I'd been taught at school. You know, they talk about spirit, but I didn't know what it was. Nobody could explain to me what it was. And suddenly I realized meditation made spirit practical, a practical experience that I could uh, that I could just experience just like that, like I can look out of the window and see the trees. So John, can I just interrupt you a little bit? So what do you think it was on the mantra? Do you think it was sound? Do you think it was this? Because you weren't saying it out loud, I presume you were saying the mantra internally. Do you think it was sound that gave you this immediate opening up to spirit? I don't know what it was, Vicky. I, I don't know, but it's uh, it's gone on happening ever since. Uh, it just <laughs> seems natural. <laughs> it's a natural thing. So you mean you kept you've kept at it diligently? I think for over sixty years now, haven't you, John? Uh -huh. yeah. And I was very impressed because I came with you. You you go into the you wake up very early in the morning at four thirty. And you go into, you've got a key, haven't you? They've given you a key to the church. Yes. And you go in there every morning for two hours in the morning and two hours in the evening. Yes. And so, I mean, this seems like a very obvious question, but, well, A, has it, it ha, have you developed? And secondly, what does it give you? What does it mean? Because it's a very, very long time and you have been so diligent. Uh, you know, and so and so um, disciplined. So you, there has to be something in it for you. This is, I'm talking now for the people who are listening and watching this because they, you know, most of us fall by the wayside very, very early. But something must have been so strong for you that it's kept you at it. Well, that's easy. It's, it's uh, love. Can you can you explain a little bit? <laughs> Who knows what love is? <laughs> like all real things in life, it cannot be explained. <laughs> so you mean from the very beginning, you, you from the very first time, you felt love from when you meditated? Vicky, dear, uh, I, I sort of we jumped uh, the first twenty years of my life. Yes, I know. I'm coming back to that. I'm coming back to that. I'm coming. I haven't forgotten that. <laughs> in which I didn't really explain my my love of not being fenced in of wide open spaces. So please explain right. about your, because as, I, as, as I've wanted to say, is that your path has been very much the path of love. So please explain, yes. 
<laughs> I'm used to the open fields, both as a child and as a farmer. So I've loved the open fields and uh, which of course are quiet, aren't they? And, uh, yes. I'm alone absolutely. in the open fields, there are no people <laughs> there. It's just the open fields, the sky, the infinite sky above and Mother Earth beneath. And so that's what I love naturally. <laughs> that, uh, that's home, that's where I belong. And, uh, and, uh, and in contrast, not that I've that much experience of the big city and, and crowds of people, but enough to know that I prefer the wide open spaces. And uh, certainly I've become much, well, I'm more tolerant now as an old man, but, but certainly as a young man, I, 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 uh, I, I love that without question. And the marvelous thing about meditation is that even meditating in the middle of, in the middle of London, uh, I could access this silent space. Right. Okay. And, and, and so the great comfort of my life, which is, which is, uh, well, see, as, as I learned more about uh, spirit, I began to realize that there's this marvelous sequence, which is silence, which is stillness, because silence is still, what is it? And then space, well, where does one end and the other begin? Aren't they all really the same thing? Silence, stillness, space, peace. There is peace. It's just this, isn't it? It's just the space, the silence. And we're in it like fishes in the sea. We can never not be at peace. How can anybody not? But we don't see it. You see, this is the problem. We, don't, we, we get locked into this agitated state of mind and miss what's in front of our noses. Mm. Even more than in front of our noses is what keeps us, what contains us, this ocean of, of peace. And then develop that a bit longer, peace, presence, love, spirit, God. Where does one end and the other begin? Mm. It's all, it's all just one thing. It, it's just, it's just that, you know, it, it gets a bit difficult to talk about God straight away because people get put off by it. But if you just talk about silence, it's so simple. There's no argument about silence, no contention there. But, but this is just the forerunner, as it were, of a deepening awareness of silence, deeper and deeper into silence. It's like going into the sky. How far do you go into the sky? There's no end to it, is there? Look up at the stars and there's no end. So it is with spirit, it's just exactly the same. And you find this within yourself and just, it has no end. It is the great adventure without end. Yes. And I've always been an adventurer, dear. I've had some terrific adventures in this life, but this is the great adventure that never fails. It just gets better and better. <laughs> of course, again, I'm talking as an old man now, but all our failures and just sort of the restrictions and the things that don't work out in this life, you really find are all perfectly fulfilled in spirit. But that's rather a long story. It's taken me a long time to realize that, but that's yes. the effect of it. So how can I not love meditation? You know, in the confusion of life, honestly, one of the best things you can possibly do is just look out of the window. Because the moment you look out of the window, there's the sky, isn't there? And the sky is completely untroubled by what's going on in the world. The sky is just, it's just there, this, this eternal reassurance just beaming down on us. Mm. Well, see, meditation is really just looking out of the window within, within one's own mind. <laughs> John, I, I, you make it sound so simple, and I think I think you have been exceptional in how quickly you um, managed to achieve this state. But I'd like to give some encouragement to the people who are listening to this and watching this. But one has to start slowly and take it, and not really, uh, and be kind to oneself. You know, just keep going slowly, slowly. You know, and maybe not have instant results. What do you think? Oh, it's absolutely, absolutely essential. Don't look for results. Yes, it's most important principle of meditation. Yes. Don't look for results because all you're doing is projecting some idea of your own. But uh, all results uh, are futile because the real result can't be described. See, how can you describe freedom? 
how can you describe spirit? Yes. You don't really can. It's beyond, it, description belongs to a very little thing called duality. If you describe something, it's not something else, is it? Yes. So it's always misleading to get bogged down in results. Yes. Um, and we compare, don't we, all the time? Oh, yes, that's hopeless. There's all this uh, yes. exercise of the mind. Yes. Yes. And, and, and don't worry about thoughts either in meditation. Uh, people get spend lifetimes trying to figure out their thoughts. It's, it's whatever for. Um, <clears throat> to me, I like to think of, sorry, again, I'm waffling on. Vic. No, 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 carry you waffling. You stop me if I go off the point. No, no, no. <laughs> but, um, but you see, to me, uh, thinking is, is rather like our tummies, the way our tummies digest our food, depending... Sometimes we put th the wrong things in our tummies, we get tummy ache, don't we, or indigestion. Yes, yes. And the mind's really just a, just a digestive system for, for, for the mind. It's, it's the same sort of process. And so I can talk to you quite happily. Don't even think about my tummy, do I? Yeah. Oh, the same thing with the mind. When you meditate, you just ignore it. You just go through it and, and discover the freedom on the other side. It's like an, it's like a, it's like an airplane, you see. On a cloudy day, you live beneath the clouds and you, you just get under the weather, as it were. Yeah. And, and, but then you get in an aeroplane. Once you got through the airport, you sit back. And what happens? You go through the clouds. And what's beyond the clouds? Mm. Freedom, isn't it? Mm. Open sky. Well, that's meditation. Perfect meditation. Well, and, and so you're given a, the method of meditation. It's just like an aeroplane. It just takes you through the clouds. So you just do, do, do use your method, whatever it is. And, uh, and, and you don't jump out of the aeroplane, do you? No, of course you don't. So uh, you don't stay with the practice of the meditation, whether you've got a mantra or whatever you're doing, singing or looking at a candle or something, breathing. Just do that. If you do it attentively, you're not interested in your thoughts. You go beyond. Mm. Of course, not every, not everybody wants freedom. A lot of people love their thoughts. We're so obsessed with our with our me, our self, self centeredness, self righteousness, self everything. That actually we, we prefer to to wallow around in that. Yes. And indeed, you can spend a lifetime wallowing around in your head, um, going around in circles. Well, that's okay if that's what you want. <laughs> if, you want, if, you want, if you want the big, the big stuff, if you want freedom, <laughs> you've got to find something better. You? <gasps> That's right. John, I'd like to ask you, what is your definition of God? I don't know. Dear, nobody knows what God is. How can you define God? If I defined God, i just put God in a little box. And then God wouldn't be something else, would he? How can anybody define God? How can anyone define freedom or love even or peace or silence? None of the real things in life can be defined. I read that you defined him once and I thought it was wonderful because it, it, it tallies a lot with Buddhism. Um, I think you called him um, special consciousness or unobstructed consciousness or something. I thought that if I ever said that, I never knew what <laughs> consciousness was until after I, I, I were in a school where I was taught to meditate. I'd never heard of all this spiritual language when I started to meditate. And then gradually this word consciousness was introduced and it took me ages to figure out what they were talking about <laughs> to understand what it was. <laughs> I, th I think eventually I, I, I got the idea that it's silence, but I'm, I'm not sure if that's right. Yes. Um, so I don't really like using these long words, Vicky. I, yes. I'd rather keep simple. Yes, but, yes. but <laughs> I, I, I think of, of all the various descriptions of God I have heard of, um, one of the ones that appealed to me most was absolute simplicity. Mm. Yes, I, I, I like that. Mm. Because he, it, it, it's it's just it's just in a way like yes. silence amplified into the 
infinite, isn't it? Well, silence is infinite, but is it uh, infinite, infinite, isn't it? And uh, there's absolutely no division. It's it's just, you know, people use words like one, one, and absolute one, well, all these just words, words, aren't they? I know what it is, darling. It's like going up on the hill and, and you just look, you just look at the space. What's that? John, I noticed that in your in your flat uh, that you had lots and lots of icons, yes. which I which I like very much of Mary and the child, yeah. and in amongst them was one picture of Ramana Maharshi, who I used to yeah. read about and study. So I wonder if you could just say a couple of words about the relevance to you of those two figures, the the the, the icon of Mary and also. Ramana Maharshi. Well, I was blessed to spend several years in Russia and uh, where I learned a lot about, um, it was like discovering uh, Christianity for, for an, a second time because it's, you know, in, the, in Russia they have what's called orthodoxy. Yes. We got quite a, a different understanding to, to, to at least modern day Western understanding of the faith. And I learned a lot there, for which I'm very grateful. And um, and orthodoxy uh, puts a great emphasis on the saints. It has a you know, saint for every possible place and person, almost personality. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and they're very instructive because they're like examples of how to live that sort of life. The Russian Orthodoxy is primarily what's called by scholars, I think, uh, uh, Marian or whatever the word is. It's based on, on the mother. You right. see, see, Russia is considered the Holy Mother Russia, Mother uh, Mother Russia, and all Russian culture is very much mother orientated, um, and. Uh, and it said that a particular famous icon you may have noticed in my flat, uh, called mm. v- Vladimirskaya I- I- icon, is uh, enshrines the spirit of Russia, and I have no doubt it does. And um, and tears are part of it. The mother's tears. This is this is integral to the Russian understanding of life. Mm. Um, Yes, the, the the story of Mary, um, Mary <coughs> grieving for her son. Um, so uh, my few years of Russia, yes, brought icons into my life. I was never much of one for for, for symbols and that, but uh, but I learned what I could when I was in Russia and learned to love icons and and um, and the other thing you mentioned was. Uh, what was the other thing? Ramana, Ramana Maharshi. Oh, 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 I think I was I was just in a bookshop one day. I'd never heard of him, and I, I, I noticed. A, I think there was a picture of him with a cow, and uh, <laughs> of course, being a farmer, loving cows, <laughs> I picked that up and looked, and then I read that he didn't say very much. So, so, so those two things endeared him to me. I see. <laughs> that, that, that he taught by just sitting silently and loved cows. That was enough for me. And I didn't bother too much about anything else, really. But uh, I did get one or two little books and, and read him and, and loved what he wrote. It, it, it seemed to very much echo what, what I felt myself. So I've always felt a sort of, <laughs> that's, that's a, a sympathy. A, a, well, at the risk of prompting you, which I'm going to, he talked a lot about the self, didn't he? Uh, yeah. And I wondered, uh, yes, and I, it's quite, com- I, I, I studied him too. I was very attracted to him as well. And um, it took me a long time because Buddhism talks about no self. So I was quite conflicted about Ram- Ramana's yes. talking about it and my teachings about 
self and I think I've understood it much more now. It doesn't mean that you're kind of egocentric, does it? I mean... No, that's exactly that. that what I, I couldn't... When I first heard of the self in that sense, I, 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 with consciousness, it took me ages to try to understand what it meant. Yeah. They were talking about... And I never use the word myself. It, it's not part of my vocabulary. Um, right. I don't really like it and... Uh, um, and and uh, if some if, if Ramana Maharshi used the word well, it didn't make any impression on me really. Okay. Okay. Um, it, it, uh, people use the self to indicate higher reality. Well, I don't really think very much like that. Uh, yeah, this morning I, I went out for a walk through the meadows around here and. There was a group of young cattle, and uh, I was ever so touched that I just stood still and, and they came close to me. And uh, I just love that. And that, in a way, means more to me than, than all this talk about mm. realization, all that sort of thing. Mm. I suppose for me, it's love has always been, in a way, the direct link to what one might call God. And, um, Yes, I'd much rather think of Ramana Maharshi really with his arm around a cow's neck than, than um, talking about self something or other. Mm. What, do we, what do we mean by it all? Yes, I can talk about it. I've lived long enough and had enough experience now to, to know what people mean by it. But um, devotion, is devotion... Uh, It's devotion, dear. No, no. Jesus didn't talk about the self, did really. he? No. It's become a sort of fashionable in today's sort of spiritual language, but I'm not a very modern person. I'm rather old-fashioned. I don't sort of I feel I don't really belong in this world of self-realization. <laughs> maybe, maybe I've come in by the back door. I'm not sure. <laughs> That's rather to judge. <laughs> I was very moved watching one of your broadcasts, John, when you just naturally called yourself Mr. Nobody. Yes, well, that makes sense to me. The less of me, the more of God. Well, I began to learn that as a young farmer. That um, when I began to realise that the best, I the less I interfered, the better things went. <laughs> Nature knew better than I did. <laughs> yes. And, um, and after all, who is what is close to God? Oh, not the animals. And what's the difference? The animals don't talk about me, do they, all the time? <laughs> they're, they're, they're not bothered about making judgments of other people. They're marvelously. Oh, what could. Yeah. Yeah, Jesus calls himself a good, the good shepherd. And I remember, as a young man, I think, yes, I know, when I was still in. Peru and was coming home and didn't really know what to do with myself and I thought I'll try to be a good shepherd like Jesus, literally a good shepherd, not the wrong people but the sheep. So I bought myself a flock of sheep when I came home and started farming sheep. And I've always felt sheep are among the greatest teachers because they're so humble, pure souls. And um, if you asked me how I've got a quiet voice, I could say, from talking to sheep, maybe. <laughs> That's lovely. But John, you've also had some very hard times in your life. Yes. You've had, you've had 20, I think it was 20 years when you were lonely and felt uh, loveless and, yes, and yes. had depression. Um, looking back on that now, what do you think that was about, and how did you come out of it? Well, I'm not sure I've ever come out of it. Yeah, it's not just 20 years. I think I've been lonely all my life. I think if there's one uh, adjective that has persisted since I, was, uh, since I was first sent to boarding school at the age of seven into the company of other little boys, I think almost, I'm not sure that I've lost it even completely even now. I've been lonely. 
I've never really found that that uh, that total companionship in this life. I've never really found a company of an old, a human organization where I felt I could belong. Mm. I suppose uh, uh, I, I am. Mother was Russian. She was uh, a refugee from the Russian Revolution. Um, in the 1920s, and uh, and I, it was only when I went to Russia that I felt among my own people. Really, I think those were among the happiest years of my life. Really, in Russia, I felt I belonged there. People there thought and felt as I did, but um, I wouldn't say it entirely. Sort of purged me of this loneliness. Yes, I think this loneliness has been this this craving for total love. And in human experience, one doesn't often find, in my experience, uh, the totality of love. And that's what I've always longed for. There was always something missing in the love experiences I've had. And um, and I longed for more. I longed for the stars. Mm. And um, so I've lived with loneliness all my life. And meditation, Funnily enough, I think another occasion, I spent some time in the desert, in the deserts in Africa, in uh, Namibia and Kalahari, and uh, mm. I know quite a lot about deserts, and uh, I think those are among the most not lonely times of my life, completely alone, completely alone under the stars in the desert. I think there I felt closer to I suppose the infinite love that I longed for. Yes, indeed I have. Yes, in I wrote a book about. It's called uh, Mystic Naturally in Africa. I remember describing that mm -hmm. that sense of total of being absorption into total love under the under the desert stars. Beautiful experience, and yet in, in, to bring it down to human context, it's 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 never big enough. That's what I found. I've longed for the totality of it, this uh, self-abandonment, total self-abandonment into infinite love. And I suppose if you want to just me to sort of bring that back to meditation, this has really been what my motive in meditation, this self-abandonment. Yes, I think that describes it very well, mm -hmm. self-abandonment to love. Um, to freedom, to, to, to love primarily. You, you're, um, you've got, you have a new book coming out called um, Of Mystic Union. Yes, yes, yes I have actually. I've got it down, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, this is the, the last of my ten books. And, and you could say, in fact, it's the final chapter when I think with the, the duality of, of I love you which somehow never fully works out, is finally dissolved in realizing that when men and women come together in, of course, in this world of physical, you know, appearance, we're all separate. And in meditation, as you gradually develop insight, you, be, you learn to see not with these physical eyes, which are really the eyes of death, the eyes of mortality. You don't see anything really with this. These eyes are spiritual blindness. And these ears are spiritual deafness. You, 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 when you, as you access this, this is the upper air in meditation, then, then, then you begin to to the, the invisible, the silent world then begins to come into reality. It seems nothing from down here, but the more you immerse yourself in it, the more real it becomes. You know, in, 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 as a farmer, it was the fairies, you know, the, that was what was real, the sense of, of, the, of the nature spirits, the, 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 you know, that, that, that could sit on a flower without hurting it, whereas I couldn't. See my feet, clumsy feet crushed in daisies, and the fairy could sit on it without hurting it. Why can't I be like a fairy? You see? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and yes, in meditation, in spirit, you realize that in spirit you can, you can live in spirit without hurting anything, without hurting anyone. And the love of spirit is completely without demands. It's just totally all-embracing, 
embracing the whole world without limit. Um, and and, uh, and of course, being human, I've spent my life, you know, in the I love you level of love. Yes. Or, you know, usually the trouble is she doesn't love me, isn't it? That's the trouble. But <laughs> what, <laughs> what doesn't love me enough <laughs> the way I want it. <laughs> but uh, but that that as we dwell ever more in spirit, and this is what's marvelous about dying out, you see, because the impediment, which is this, this mortality dies out, then then spirit becomes ever takes over as it were ever more, and it becomes ever more obvious that real life is spirit, and in spirit, of course, there are no men and women; <laughs> it's all one. <laughs> And uh, when you pass through the Adam and Eve phase, it's all one. And then you go beyond that too, into the total one. And then ultimately, your love problems come to an end because because it's like waking up from a dream. They they never were as it it, it was this appearance you see of man and woman that we get hung up on. And why we all have these endless problems in this world. But when we come back home to spirit, which of course is, is where we come from originally, then, then this whole uh, bad dream of mortality, of mortal existence, literally dies out and with it the problems. Yes. So this is what I, what I describe in this book of Mystic Union, which, is, as you see, isn't printed yet, but hopefully it will be one day. And then, and then for those that are interested. <laughs> so, so you, you you are not fearful of death, or you probably don't even wonder what's going if anything is going to happen I mean, at all. Well, I don't know. I know. I didn't. Nobody really knows for sure. But um, <laughs> but I think meditation is rather like dying. I've always thought that. Yes, really. Because, because when you meditate, well, very soon after people practice, I've taught, I can't count as people to meditate. I know enough about it to know that very often, almost the very first time they meditate, they, well, where was I? What happened? You know, <laughs> you know they, they forget about their bodies, don't they? And uh, they even forget about their thoughts for a few few moments. Yes. So what happens? Uh, the... the um, it just, it's no really big deal just to sort of go out of the body and, and, and grow into what's beyond the, the, the body. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, we forget about the body when we go to sleep every night, don't we? John, you've ended it just perfectly. Mm. Thank you. Really, really precious what you've given us. <laughs>